Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to uh, the first uh, piece of programming from the uh, Yale program of the study of antisemitism uh, in the spring 2024 semester. Uh, I'm David Walsh. Um, I'm postdoctoral associate um, at the uh, program for the study of antisemitism. Um, and I want to welcome uh, this afternoon uh, Magda Tedder. Uh, who will be giving a talk, uh, Antisemitism and Racism, uh, A Shared History. Uh, just to introduce uh, Professor Tedder briefly, she is the Professor of History and Schwidler Chair of Judaic Studies at Fordham University. Uh, she's the author of Jews and Heretics in Catholic Poland, Sinners on Trial, Jews and Sacrilege After the Reformation, Blood Libel on the Trail of an Antisemitic Myth, uh, which won the National uh, Jewish Book Award in 2020. It's Fantastic book. I highly recommend it to you all. And most recently, uh, Christian Supremacy, Reckoning with the Roots of Antisemitism and Racism, which was published in 2023. Um, Professor Tedder has received fellowships from the John Simon Guggenheim Memorial Foundation, the Harry Frank Guggenheim Foundation, uh, the Harvard Radcliffe Institute, the Coleman Center at the New York Public Library, the National Endowment for the, the National Endowment for the Humanities, excuse me, and uh, uh, others. Uh, Professor Tedder is currently the president of the American Academy of Jewish Research. So we are very, very pleased and very honored that she is with us today. And Professor Tedder, please take it away. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm delighted to be with you to, today and to share um, my work and my screen with you. Um, so uh, let me do that. Um, so let me first um, say a few words about how this book came about, because I was uh, trained as a historian of uh, uh, Jewish history, a Jewish experience. Uh, my early work is in Eastern Europe, uh, Poland, Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth, and then um, I expanded a little bit geographically. Uh, but this book really uh, is one that reaches across fields. And um, one of the reasons why I was, I've been thinking um, that we need to rethink and find new approaches to um, the study of antisemitism is that I've been frustrated with the historiography of antisemitism. Uh, scholars have been debating over um, uh, um, definitions, over spelling, uh, what uh, time periods, what's the difference between anti-Judaism, anti-Jewish, Ju anti-Judaic, anti-Semitism, Judeophobia, um, is um, now we're obviously discussing the question of anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism. Is this eternal hatred? Is it a modern phenomenon? And th these debates are, you know, producing lots of books um, and articles and, and scholarly conversations have never sort of felt for me that they are really, um, really uh, getting us somewhere. And I'm not the first one. David Engel just told us to get rid of all the definitions and move and discuss what was really happening. And then I had this sort of revelation um, in 2016 when I was at the premiere of um, uh, Raoul Peck's film, I Am Not Your Negro, in which he uh, play, has this, uh, this clip of James Baldwin and the PBS program, The Negro and the American Promise, in which, um, in which um, Baldwin um, uh, uses the N-word very emphatically and very consciously, I will not use it, but uh, saying, essentially asking why is it, why was, why it was necessary to have the N in the first place? Because I am not an N, I am a man. Um, in if you think that I am N, it means that you need him. And if you am I'm not the N here, then you, and you invented him, you, the white people invented him, then you have to find out why. And that, when I saw the scene, it was this big revelation that this is exactly like the Jew invented by uh, by Christians. And just to give you a sense of both what Baldwin meant and what I mean by the sort of caricature of a, a person of a of an image that doesn't really exist and has nothing to do with the living, uh, either in James Baldwin's place. Uh, black people or Jews in, in the case of, of the Jews. So the example of the 
the end and the creation of that uh, of that caricature in contrast to whiteness um, is uh, are, are some of the illustrations in a in a very um, uh, in a book that actually argued for or against the very humanity of black people here. Um, and, and here's another example, juxtaposing the, you know, white bodies against the caricatured black uh, body. And here is an example of, a, of a, this is a Nazi children's book of the contrast between the um, the Aryan German and the, the Jew. Um, here is uh, Fagin from uh, from Oliver Twist. Um, uh, and again, you can sort of see the the girl and the aesthetic of the girl girl versus the the representation of the Jew and very very similar uh, uh, terms uh, of presentation and contrasting. So I've been reading um, and learning about um, Black history and American history just for my own um, interest, um, because again, I was I grew up in Europe and then I was trained in the United States in Jewish history, uh, but on my own, I was reading um, on Black history. And one of the things that it kept I kept marking on the margins of the books that I was reading is similarities between um, the way Black people were discussed or described or um, ideas that were associated with and with that what uh, what was with Jews. So we have uh, both of them were obviously cursed by God for different reasons. Uh, both serve as these contract fi contrast figures constitutive either in, in the case of Black people uh, of white, white identity or in contrast of Jews, really important and constitutive to Christianity and Christian, uh, Christian identity. Both were seen as lazy, um, for different reason, uh, but both at the expense of, uh, of in Jews' case, the Christians, and in the case of Black people, the, the white uh, population. Um, they were both seen as, um, in different ways, as arrogant, insolent, uh, or uh, apathy um, in, in moments when they were trying to assert their rights or, or, or their dignity. Um, they were both in modern times um, seen as ineligible for citizenship because of, and this is from the people generous uh, and and willing eventually to maybe uh, grant Jews and Black people citizenship at, uh, uh, for um, uh, after centuries of oppression and this sort of uh, uplift suasion idea. Um, both were discussed as a question, as a problem. Um, and uh, in the modern times, they were both um, re refused to be accepted as equal citizens. And when they, the law changed and, and both eventually reluctantly were accepted as citizens, um, they were, there was an immediate backlash. So, and they were both also in terms of the, uh, the uh, seen as carnal and dangerous. And here I'm going to show you a couple of other images. Uh, here, here are some images of the lecherous, dangerous black men, dangerous to white women. Um, and there is a, 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 an, an example of those images of uh, the lecherous uh, Jew. And uh, again, in, in case of uh, black uh, Americans, we know that this often ended in lynchings. Um, uh, the one case we know of similar uh, dynamic in America of Leo Frank was also related to that. But in in the in Europe, um, that dynamic was uh, was seen in different ways and and uh, expressed in violence also in, in different ways. Um, so the it, so, so in that in my in both sort of seeing these parallels and in my frustration with the field of anti-Semitism studies, I've been sort of searching for understand, uh, understanding, and I thought that the the parallels are so uncanny that they needed some explanation. And the uh, longest hatred idea that uh, that has been uh, so dominant in the scholarship on uh, anti-Semitism or the modernity of anti-Semitism did not quite um, feel satisfying. Um, so as I've been teaching, uh, and the, and again, the value of comparison uh, was actually. Um, uh, 
again, not something that I invented. Um, W.E.B. Du Bois, after visiting Europe several times, and then the Warsaw Ghetto in 1948, um, he wrote his um, essay um, on the, the, the Negro and the Warsaw Ghetto, in which he highlighted the, 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 the value of his experiences, that it helped him not so much, gave him not so much clearer understanding of the Jewish problem in the world, as it was a real and more complete understanding of the Negro problem. So for me, engaging with Black studies has given me, I think, a clear understanding of, um, of the Jewish experience and, Jew and, uh, and anti-Semitism or anti-Jewish animus um, by engaging and thinking um, along the way and reading about anti-Black racism. In the 30s and, and 40s, other scholars, both Jewish and, and Black intellectuals, uh, were co making connections between um, the, the two uh, in essays and, and uh, in, in case of some of Black, um, black intellectuals to uh, draw attention to what was happening to, to Black people in America uh, through the experience and concern that was raised about the Nazi treatment of Jews uh, before the Holocaust in the 1930s especially, and then afterwards. Uh, in 1948, a, a really wonderful film, um, Strange Victory by Leo Hor Horwitz, which I call a, a poetic meditation on racism and anti-Semitism, and I, know that it seems strange, but it's a really poetic film uh, that brings these two together uh, and and sort of uh, combines the both the experience in Europe and the current, uh, what was current in 1948 experiences of Black Americans and also uh, the persistence of anti-Semitism in America as well. So one of the, the ways that thinking and reading about racism uh, is that um, that it often focuses on structures, on law, on oppression, uh, coming th not just from ideas and um, and uh, culture, although culture is, is is seen broadly, but also from within the the, the role that law and and again structural racism plays. And that is always seen in the context of power and oppression. And, uh, and here that helped help me think through uh, some of the languages and hierarchies that emerge in the uh, Christian theology first about Jews, but then later on have an impact on law and legal framework and legal position of Jews uh, in both pre-modern and modern period. So let me uh, flesh out the um, the theology, and I'm not going to be looking actually with the traditional texts that uh, focus on the crucifixion or Judas or other um, other parts of the uh, Christian scriptures, but actually uh, on Paul uh, and his letters, because to me they play a crucial role in um, in uh, the later on framing of social hierarchies and habits of thinking about Jews and also legal frameworks. So uh, Paul establishes a hierarchy of values um, by juxtaposing law that, is, that for him is, is Judaism and faith that for him is this emergent Christianity and uh, uses the framework of the two, the, uh, two sons that Abraham had, um, Ishmael and Isaac, one, as he says, by a slave woman, the other by a free woman, to cast them as types for Judaism and Christianity. So one, the child of a slave born according to flesh, and the other child of the free woman born through promise. Um, so Ishmael through flesh, from a slave woman from Hagar, and Isaac from a child of promise. Uh, and, and he says there are two symbols of the two covenants. Um, Mount Sinai, Judaism, bearing children for slavery, and Hagar, uh, 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 now is, uh, that is the Hagar, and then the present Jerusalem um, is, uh, uh, the present Jerusalem in slavery, and uh, and Jerusalem above is the free woman, and um, 
and uh, that is Christianity. So freedom um, is associated with Christianity, slavery, uh, and servitude with, uh, with Judaism and Jewish law. Uh, and again, he returns to it. This means that not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of promise. That is not Jews who are observing the, um, the commandments of God as they were given, uh, but the newly forming uh, uh, Christianity through faith and promise. And then he uses in, an, in a totally non-social uh, meaning, but in a theological meaning, a phrase, the elder shall serve the younger, which comes from the book of Genesis, uh, which will really uh, uh, contribute to the creation of legal hierarchies in uh, Christian um, Europe. Um, there were, I'm jumping centuries in the book, I do a little bit more detail, but uh, Augustine returns to the motive of, uh, of, of uh, the contrast between carnal uh, carnality and spirit, flesh and spirit, and promise and uh, and and flesh and so on, and elaborates more on the different pairs of the of the brothers in uh, in the Bible, and goes on to detail to explain the verse. What now at the time when he lives, which is when the uh, Roman Empire is now a formerly Christian empire. Uh, what in his new historical context, the elder shall serve the younger means. So he says uh, in the city of God, uh, as to the statement, the elder shall serve the younger, um, scarcely among uh, anyone who must think, uh, understands it in any other way than the elder people of the Jews should serve the younger Christian people. And then again, he returned what could be clear that the reference of the two promises is that the people of Israelites and to the, the whole world, the former according to flesh and the latter according to faith. Again, here it returns to those concepts. Uh, but that idea of Jews serving the younger people, the Christians, uh, and the idea that the primacy has been transferred to, uh, to Christians now uh, be begins to be slowly translated into legal framework as well. So here, what we saw just before is that uh, a, a theological concept of supersessionism, where uh, Christianity replaces uh, Judaism and Israelis and Jews uh, in from as chosen people of God. And then here we begin to have the rise of Christian supremacy. In the book, I'm very specific that I use the word supremacy in a formal legal way as um, meaning power and authority. And, uh, and that's what I see transforming theology into Christian supremacy, into political power uh, when a Roman empire uh, becomes Christian and begins to implement certain ideas into law. So here I'll give you one example, but there are others um, of a, how the, um, uh, the social hierarchy is now embedded in law and Jews are, as far as I know, um, the only group that is singled out for its ethnicity or specificity uh, in law to prohibit certain things. And here is a law that prohibits Jews uh, owning a Christian slave um, uh, and to convert uh, uh, from Christ a Christian to a Jew. This is ostensibly about, about uh, a conversion. Uh, but there is no prohibition of um, Jews owning any slaves or Christians owning Christian slaves. So that's, that's the first significance and dif differentiation. And later on, um, it will be uh, transformed into also discourse of, uh, of power. There are other uh, laws that are gradually in the Loma, Roman Christian Empire introduced, Jews not being able to uh, hold public office, uh, uh, restrictions on Jews as witnesses, and so on and so forth. Um, the this language then again, I I do a little bit more detail in in the book, but this language then gets transformed and introduced and included in canon law, 
um, in the 13th century. Um, and uh, and it is much more couched in a, in a theological explanation, returning to the question of crucifixion. Um, and that is that Jews are uh, punished uh, and are by uh, for their role in the crucifixion, and the punishment is the uh, the perpetual servitude, uh, and therefore, and this is the language of of uh, arrogance and insolence that emerges. Uh, Jews ought not to be ungrateful to us Christians, not requite Christian favorites uh, with contumely and intimacy with contempt, and uh, and then uh, the the Pope. Uh, asks the French rulers to restrain the excesses of Jews that they shall not dare raise the, their neck, bowed under the yoke of perpetual servitude against the reverence of Christian faith, lest the children of a free woman should be slaves to the children of a slave, but rather as slaves rejected by God, recognize themselves as the slaves of those whom Christ's death set, set free, at the same time as it enslaved them. Henceforth, the perfidious Jews should not in any other way dare grow insolent. And in canon law and uh, church law, it, it, it keeps coming back that Jews uh, are guilty and consigned to perpetual servitude. They exchange servitude, they owe, the, that they attempt to exchange the servitude they owe to Christians for dominion over there, you begin to, to, to not begin, but you see the language of power here, insolence, and then a repetition that uh, as, as long as they persist in their errors, they should recognize through experience that they have been made slaves while Christians have been made free through Jesus Christ, God, our Lord, and that it is iniquitous that the children of the free woman should serve the children of a maid servant. In secular law, it is translated into prohibition of Jews having Christian servants. Again, restrictions on how many Jews could be witnesses against Christians, and um, also um, the uh, restrictions on public office uh, and, and so on and so forth. Um, lest you think this is a pre-modern idea, but you, here you can you can hear the echoes of that language from 1945 in, in Poland, just after the war, a bishop of Kielce me, in, at the meeting with Jewish um, community leaders says, you know that Jews are talented merchants, doctors, and lawyers, and Poland is destroyed and needs its strength. Why don't Jews do what they are capable of? Why do they engage in politics? Can you imagine what it looks like when a priest comes to a ministry and a Jewish woman is sitting there, God knows from where, and treats our clergy with superiority and insolence? So here you also have a gendered aspect, but it shows you here that language of hierarchy and, the, and Jews in a position of power um, uh, giving a sense of uh, of sense of superiority and unearned superiority and insolence as as the the bishop here um, here shows. Um, so what do we what we have is we have the uh, the essentially theology turning into supremacy in in the legal format. Uh, and those the law reifies the idea of Christian superiority and the social position of Jews in in legal terms that they cannot do certain things. There are laws against them, and that affirms a sense of um, of Christian domination, uh, both in itself for themselves, but also against Jews and the, the you know questions of contempt and uh, and unease with Jews in any kind of positions that do not conform to that position of servitude. Um, so that's when we have this um, rise of the trope of Jewish power, this discomfort with Jews in any other position than the position of servitude um, and, and seen as unearned and undeserved uh, social uh, position. This is translated into visual language, ubiquitous medieval um, imagery of the ecclesia and synagogue, ecclesia representing Christianity as this uh, dominant queen and synagogue as this humiliated, blindfolded maiden. 
Uh, sometimes there are a couple of images where she's not blindfolded, but she's still uh, seen as a, as a maiden against the queen, queen, uh, Christian queen, Ecclesia. Um, and again, that iconography continues and even into the um, 18th century, although it does become less ubiquitous from 16th century on. So what about racism? How does it play uh, a role? This, this whole thing plays a role in racism. And that comes in at the moment when Europe begins to expand across the uh, Atlantic and begins to engage in the um, in the transatlantic slave trade. And we begin to see a shift in iconography. And I'll show you that in a moment. But what we see is um, a, a, an application of these concepts of powers, of the idiom of power, uh, for Jews, uh, obviously, we see it in as an idiom, um, and although in, in a servitude and enslavement, but it it translates into affirming of the lower status of Christians as inferior uh, of Jews uh, in Christianity as inferior to Christians, and again habits of thinking of Jews as inferior. In the case of Black people, there's actual enslavement. Um, so it's not the language and the idea that comes first, but it's the enslavement uh, that is come, comes first. Um, the subjections to enslavers the, and the question of power to dehumanize. There's a, 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 a phrase in uh, one of the slave narratives, um, uh, the power to dehumanize, I can put you in my pocket by selling you. Um, and the black people who were enslaved had no legal power. There was uh, violence and exploitation. Again, there is violence and exploitation in different ways um, against Jews in their inferior position in Christian Europe. Uh, but here there is this direct uh, slave, uh, slave, uh, enslaver and enslaved person power, uh, violence and exploitation. But again, it contributes also to this um, to thinking about black black people as perpetually inferior, and in fact, it inflects our language. The word which is so ubiquitously used now, and I urge people not to use it to denigrate uh, uh, denigrare in uh, in Latin gains in the early modern period the meaning that we use it now as as the meaning as degrading to de denigrate to the de the meaning to degrade. But it essentially means to make someone black. So it's to mean to degrade someone to a black person's status. And that's why I think we should we should stop using this word. But iconography, this iconographically, it also transforms the ecclesia now is transformed into Queen Europa, Europa Regina, um, where she is still a Christian queen. Uh, and is has very similar posture is shown as very similar posture as the um as the ecclesia from the medieval period but now she does not rule over the synagogue but she rules over and dominates over the other continents and again that iconography becomes ubiquitous um in this early modern work by Cesare Ripa uh, which describes how painters should paint these different different figures, but including the continents. Uh, Europa is described as this queen um, uh, uh, with abundance of food, knowledge, and power, and the other uh, continents are in various state of undress and, uh, and civilization. But until the 18th century, Africa is still um, not racialized as black. It it was only um, by the late 16th and uh, early 18th, I mean, the, uh, by the late 17th and early 18th century that we begin to see Africa as racialized as, um, as Black. And that is certainly influenced by the various uh, books that uh, that uh, focus on the religions and of the book of the peoples of outside of Europe uh, that begin to emerge in the late 17th century on. This is again, translate the idea here, the, the, we see it in law and we see it in law that is very similar to the laws of the Roman empire of uh, regulating who can uh, own other 
other people, uh, other human beings as uh, as slaves. And in the um, uh, Act Concerning Servants and Slaves in Virginia, we see a hierarchy of both race and religion. Um, so um, no Negro, mulatto, or Indian, so the, these are racial groups, although Christian, right, so they may be Christian, or Jews, Moors, and Mahometans, that is non-Christians, and, and, or other infidels, should purchase a Christian servant, nor any other, except of their own complexion. But if any Negro, mulatto, Indian, Jew, Moor, Mahometan, or other infidel uh, should, uh, should pur purchase any Christian white servant, the said servant shall ipso facto become free. So here we have Christianity and whiteness associated with freedom, but religion and, and race are in that, uh, in that area of uh, a lower area, inferior area, subject to, um, to enslavement. Um, and Liberté is um, displayed as this white woman, and again, in a very similar iconographic language as the Ecclesia earlier and then Europa later. And uh, America, uh, interestingly, changes race once the United States um, emerges as, a, as an independent power. And America is now represented as Colomb Colombia uh, as a white woman compared to that America shown in the early modern period. And again, that Colombia is explicitly a, a, a white woman displayed in the 19th century and on. Um, so what we have, we have here a somewhat replaced um, in, in inverted order. First comes enslavement, then the development of the idea of race to justify the, the Europeans were really struggling, especially in the Enlightenment period, with uh, justifying the enslavement of other human beings and had to find justification. So race became and difference became an explanation. And therefore, and from that um, emerged the ideology of racism and the ideology of white supremacy. Again, we have white supremacy in law earlier, but the ideology. Uh, so, and that again is contrasted, that uh, that order is contrasted with what we've seen earlier, where the idea of, of superiority comes before the actual law and actual domination. But non the, uh, nonetheless, the two converge in uh, white Christian supremacy. And for me, that was very important because when, uh, when we've seen, uh, especially in the aftermath of George Floyd's death, um, all the, that it's, it's white supremacy, white supremacy, uh, people often forgot that it's actually white Christian supremacy because the, uh, the, the, both the law, the history, but also the people who espouse it, it really do not see Jews as part of that order. And we've seen it certainly in 2017 in Charlottesville. Uh, where the white supremacists were chanting, Jews shall, will not replace us. Um, again, echoing the replacement theory from a different perspective and a, um, and a, a expressing white Christian supremacy. In the modern period, the pre-modern the, the pre-modern period set these hierarchies and habits of thinking about Jews and black people as uh, inferior, um, and uh, and but it, but these ideas then clashed with the modern ideas of equality and ci citizenship. How do those uh, social hierarchies then uh, face up to the ideas of uh, equality and citizenship? And as the modern nations at the end of the 18th century were inventing the new idea of the we, um, uh, we the people, um, and seeking what this meant, the question was whether J Jews and black people belong in the new we. And in fact, during the French Revolution, uh, the same people that were debating the citizenship about uh, of Jews were also debating the uh, eligibility of black and free black people, not just enslaved people, but free black people for citizenship. Um, so this uh, this is certainly um, certainly an issue, and uh, and Jews by that time 
are already racialized as Oriental and as coming from Asia. And the question becomes whether they can, not just as uh, not just uh, on the religious basis, also as you can see in um, the Johann uh, Michaelis uh, text, uh, the law of Moses, does law of Moses uh, make citizenship and full integration of the Jews impossible? I think it does. They will never become fully integrated the way Catholics, Lutherans, Germans, once and French live together, right? The religion uh, uh, ostensibly pro pre prevents Jews from this integration, uh, but there's also this racial, they are they stem from Asia and differ from others. Um, but the issue was uh, not human rights and civil rights at some level of residence, but really political rights, the equality of rights as citizens and active citizens. Uh, the same questions were in the Netherlands. Do we continue to regard Jews as people, as alien residents, or regard them as Dutchmen? Um, uh, are they fellow beings um, or or are they equal or on equal footing with Dutchmen? Um, and again, collectively speaking, Jews cannot share in our Dutch social rights as citizens as long as they are Jews, right? There's this religion, Jewishness and religion preventing them. Um, and that one of the members of the debate said, well, that it, we need to decide whether we in the Netherlands honor the rights of men or only a Christian men the rights of citizens are only of rights of Christian citizens. So again, this is around religion, uh, protecting the Christian supremacy in Europe, but there is this element of racialization already then, and uh, and it will, um, it will become more apparent in the 19th century. But again, these debates over Jews and people who are debating it keep um, the question of people of color, black people as well, in their minds. And here is from the same debate of a, Jew, a Jewish citizenship in the Netherlands, um, a reference to uh, the slaves of San Domingo, uh, that it was it was too fast, right? Jews shouldn't be given the citizenship right too fast. They should be, um, the, the, the pace should be slower because look at what happened in San Domingo. Uh, the untimely equality granted to the slaves of San Domingo served to the destruction of that French population. Um, and again, it continues that is it Jew, uh, Christian rights for whom were these rights developed? Uh, Bruno Bauer, uh, who sees Jews as a problem, um, uh, says that this was, all that debate was really only for the Christian world, uh, not for, for Jews. Uh, Wilhelm Marr, um, the person behind the anti-Semitic League and therefore the new term, the neologism, anti-Semitism, again, affirms that Jews are a Semitic race, completely different with homeland and Palestine, and then turns into the question of, um, of uh, political power. And he, in fact, he affirms that when it comes to religious persecutions, he I even take the Jews under my unconditional protection. But it was about sharing the political power, that but that political equality um, that in his mind led to alien, alien Jewish domination. And uh, he turns into voting and electoral power, electing the alien he calls masters and making them legislators and judges, right? Jew, Jews in power. Uh, similarly, a German um German uh Historian um, uh, Henry van Trotschke uh, refers to emancipation or the granting of citizenship to uh, to Jews and his di discomfort with the literal pa uh, parity. Right? He said they demanded the literal pa uh, parity, but we Germans are, after all, a Christian nation, and Jews are only a minority. Um, so that habit of thinking of Jews as inferior to Christians that we've seen developing over centuries is uh, playing itself out in a new political situation of Jews as citizens. And um, again, uh, von Treitschke also racializes Jews as Orientals. And that racialization goes back actually to these religious debates uh, of the uh, 17th early modern period, uh, where Jews are, uh, where Judaism is typically discussed in the context of 
biblical observances of Jews, and therefore they are placed um, in, uh, in, in, in Palestine, right? In, in the Holy Land, not in Europe. And the, these books tend to be kind of uh, proto-evolutionary. They show the evolution of, of um, different uh, Western, different um, uh, religions. And Judaism is always the sort of proto-religion from which emerged Christianity and different denominations of Christianity. And then there are all these other um, non-Western uh, groups, which also have uh, animal sacrifices and do different things. In fact, one book in 1705 uh, juxtaposed the customs of East Indians, so in in India, in Asia, uh, with those of Jews and uh, Jews of antiquity. And here is a page showing um, the um, the charming of the serpents um, is supposedly happening in India. Um, and comparing it to uh, Moses and his staff and this and the serpent in um, in the in the Bible, and that of course leads to exclusion Jews to Nach Palestina, uh, Jews to Palestine. You can see again that uh, that racialization and the caricature of Jews as these ugly. Uh, people uh, uh, not the Jew, the caricature Jew that get me thinking after after a Baldwin's quote. Uh, so again, that kind of process of de Europeanization of Jews, of seeing them as alien, as not being part of Europe, uh, leads to uh, that social uh, exclusion and ex and political exclusion uh, as well, and. If the debate was framed around religion or racialized religion in Europe, um, in the United States, that debate is is uh, along racial lines. And here we have uh, the first kind of genuine debate about what, what citizenship meant in the United States. The word exists, but it's not defined. In the Missouri debate, and one of the representatives from Virginia uh, spoke in the language. This is what, when I read it, it sounded like we the white people, we the Christian people, how it is very similar to the echo to me. Indian, free Negroes, mulatto slaves, tell me not that the constitution when it speaks of we the people means these. The argument in favor, including the class of, of citizens, free uh, uh, people of color goes too far. They, of course, meant we, the white people, right? They were European descendants. So that could not have been. And again, uh, can a Negro whose ancestors were important to this country and saw their slaves become a member of a political community? Think about can the Jews and their law uh, can become part of the citizens and equal rights and be on equal parts as us? Be can they be entitled, become entitled to all the rights of privileges, immunities guaranteed that uh, by that instrument of the citizen? Um, so what we see is that as we've seen the modern idea of equality, ideal of equality clashes with the established social hierarchies and FN essentially they come to the conclusion that no Jews and black people do not belong to the we. And again, uh, and when they do attain legal equality forced in America through civil war and in the United in, in Europe reluctantly granted through the legal transformations of uh, uh, European states, um, that equality is seen as unearned, usurped and uh, and out of place. And we see this today um, uh, in contemporary echoes of that exclusion, uh, inferiority and power. Um, this is a, a shot from an ad you can find on YouTube from 2018 um, about highlighting the connoisseurs of chaos, George Soros funding the left and causing all the sort of racial unrest. That draws on an earlier trope of Jews causing racial unrest in the civil rights era. Um, uh, race mixing with finance and led by Jews. Again, very similar idea behind it. And more recently, we've seen it um, in the case of um, 
of uh, Al, uh, uh, District Attorney Alvin Brack, who is black, uh, the man, uh, Manhattan when he charged um, uh, Donald Trump uh, with uh, with crimes. Um, that's one of those demonstrated. George Soros founds uh, DA Bragg. Google it. Um, so I thought I, I want to share a few concluding thoughts on how um, thinking and expanding and moving out and engaging with other fields is really helpful for one's own field. It's very difficult and it's very. Uh, feels very, one feels very vulnerable uh, exploring in a, a field in which one is not trained. You sort of realize how many things we observe over decades of work, and how you you can navigate your own field. But when you engage with a new field, uh, you learn uh, you have to learn not just you know facts, but also historiographic debates and so on and so forth. But but what I think thinking. Black studies really helped me rethink anti-Semitism in two ways. A, uh, moving beyond the emotional history of emotion of um, history of hate, you know, the longest hatred in that way, but thinking along the structures and laws and, uh, and oppression and power. But also, and that became really clear after uh, October 7th, is that um, Black studies um, and uh, highlight the experience of Black people under uh, influence and impacted by uh, by racism. This, the, the scholars focus on what racism does to people, how it oppress, how that oppression functions, and how it impacts those uh, whom it targets. The field of antisemitism focuses on, on antisemites, um, analyzes how antisemites think, and repeats and, and traces the antisemitic idea. Uh, we do not, we have not paid attention to the structures of law and power, and we have not, as scholars, paid attention to what antisemitism or anti Jewish animus more broadly beyond the modern period does to. Um, to Jews and to their uh, to their experience, to their bodily experience, we study the the Jew and how the Jew, the image of the Jew, the caricature emerges. So I'm going to stop here. So there is a little time for discussion, um, and uh, I look forward to hearing what you have to say. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Tedder. That was really, really fantastic um, and thought provoking. And there's uh, several uh, great questions already in the queue. So for those of you who have never uh, come to a YIPSA event online before, please put your questions in the Q&A uh, chat feature. Um, I forgot to say this in my introduction. You could have been doing this and some of you were doing it all throughout the talk. Um, and uh, we have about 10 to 15 minutes, uh, so we'll just dive in. Uh, the first question, uh, thank you for this discussion. Can you please shed light on how Jews of color, especially black Jews, factor into your comparative analysis while being at the intersection of both marginalized identities? This is a great question um, because I think the, uh, and this is especially uh, true for the later um, or more recent, um, you know, now, now a few decades, but relatively recent and, uh, American Jewish uh, historiography, um, the question of sort of Jewish whiteness and, and you know, how the Jews become white, the price of whiteness and all that. Um, and uh, and I do talk about it from a legal perspective. Um, I, I use uh, uh, um, Ian Haney's Lopez's phrase, white by law. That is that in, in the United States, because Jews could immigrate and be naturalized, they were white by law. They were considered light, white by law. There were other, um, obviously, uh, this, uh, for, forms of discrimination against Jews in Maryland and other, uh, some other places. There may have been even restrictions on, on voting and other places. But from a, a national perspective, um, Jews um, were could immigrate and were considered white by law. That's and, and and Laura Liebman, uh, Arnold Liebman has shown a very interesting tale of of some Jews from the uh, colonies going to England, sort of becoming 
certified and, and uh, as as white or European at least and coming into um into uh, the United States and being naturalized uh but in a, a, the point that I wanted to make is that um that uh, that discourse of Jewish whiteness uh which I think is very problematic um is also erasing the experience of Jews of color um who as as the the questioner mentioned are sort of bridging it and and th that experience again I'm not an expert and I there are scholars who have written uh, about it uh but they the Jews of color especially black um Jews are are caught in that, especially in America. And again, in, in that in America, it's very different. In Israel, there is a very different um, uh, social hierarchy there. Um, but uh, but in America, um, they were not quite Jew see, seen as Jewish by by European Jews, and they they were not quite seen as um, as having the experience of Black Americans, and and so there is this this sort of in 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 betweenness uh, here. Yeah, that there are two additional questions um, that are sort of along the same theme, although we might have already addressed the the thrust of it. Um, one on how uh, Black and Jewish communities can build solidarity amongst each other. Um, and another on this, the consequences of this shift uh, in the uh, uh, Jewish whiteness question. And, and the specific phrasing is, in the eyes of many Black citizens and theorists, Jews are white. When did this shift right. occur and, and its consequences? Yeah, and and certainly, um, uh, I mean, James Baldwin has this famous essay, um, and I don't remember the exact title, but um, Blacks, hate Jews because not because they are uh, blacks are anti-Semitic because they are hate Jews because they're white or something yeah, 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 some, yeah. Right, it's, it's, it's something, something like that uh, from the 1960s and one and and you know he is essentially questioning the position of American Jews and immigrants uh, in the United States as white and what it does and and that and there is this breakdown right even in the 1930s and 1940s uh, these intellectuals are engaging with each other. By 1960s, we have a, a breakdown of that. And um, one of the questions that I pose is: um, this is this is certainly the case, but why is James Baldwin singling out Jews? Mm -hmm. Right? He's obviously a, a, a writes in many places about whiteness, um, but. I'm not. I'm, I'm. I know he mentioned Irish here and there, and he mentioned the Italian. That you know, they arrive and they become white in the United States, and all of us actually become white when we, when we are feeling. All of us, all of us of this complexion that I have, become white when we fill out census is another thing. The United States law functions along the sort of. Uh, even if we don't identify in racial terms, right? So yes, everybody becomes white. Uh, yet he he focuses on Jews, and to me, that also signals a, a kind of discomfort with Jewish whiteness, and perhaps an unacknowledged. And I'm not just talking here about Baldwin, but unacknowledged. Um, a, objection to Jews exercising the rights of citizens. And yes, citizenship in America was framed along racial lines and whiteness. But when we reframe the question that Jews are coming as all immigrants are coming and trying to exercise their rights as citizens rather than achieve whiteness, that might change the discourse, but then that may also um, change the the perception, or, or it may highlight the discomfort with Jewish equality as well. That I I think there's is a, a play a little bit in that in there. That it's um, that the fact that Jews are singled out in that discourse of whiteness um, over other groups that are also you know coming and are white. Um, signals to me there is something going on in that way. And of course, there is this expectation that an oppressed would 
have a solidarity with the with other oppressed and so on and so forth that plays um that plays uh, plays a role and um and there is a breakdown there are all kinds of complexity issues after especially after the civil rights era um sometimes it's it's you know talking past each other's um historical experiences um the objections to affirmative actions that some Jewish groups had um, had a di very different historical meaning for Jews, especially many of whom were immigrants from Europe for whom who saw it as quotas and, and a potential problem. For Black Americans, obviously, affirmative action was entirely different. So that when, when Jews are siding against it, that feels like a betrayal. So this is this complex, um, uh, you know, cultural relations. But also the you know the relations of um, of habits of thinking and yes racial thinking as well. Yeah, I, I, so to follow up, I'm going to use moderator's prerogative because this is also I've been thinking about these issues myself. Um, to follow up on that question about how uh, uh, solidarity could be built between Black and Jewish communities in the 21st century, one of the things that strikes me, I mean, I, I've, I've read uh, Du Bois' essay on the Warsaw Ghetto uh, many times, um, and a, several, friend, uh, uh, several friends of mine are working on, you know, uh, uh, interracial and um, interfaith uh, anti-fascist organizing in the 30s and 40s. Um, and so it does seem like there is this and, and maybe this helps to explain why Baldwin singled out Jewish people in, in as, as, as the question of whiteness. There is this sense that there was this halcyon day of, you know, genuine uh, uh, anti-racist and anti-anti-Semitic organizing and solidarity uh, in the 30s and 40s. Um, was that just a ephemeral moment? Is it possible to build that kind of politics again? So there was too much happened since then. Um, well, a couple of things. So I think the um, so first, I, I realized I didn't answer the first question about how to build a solidarity, but I think this this the, your question as well ties to it. I think that um, that uh, we need to um, we need to understand sort of. Where the enemies are, right? In that way, and I and I think understanding the sort of common roots of that—that that it's about power and domination, how it builds, and how I mean, in in the in the story I tell, these stories don't necessarily intersect at a certain point, but they run on kind of parallel tracks um, because the dynamics of power and dominations are similar. It's just that they are along religious lines and racialized religious lines on one side of the Atlantic and then along racial lines on the other side of the Atlantic. And um, uh, when Jews obviously arrive in the United States in the in 19th century or even earlier in the 18th century, late 18th century after the revolution or, or um, uh, the 19th early Republic, they are uh, they they love the idea that they are seen as as equal because religion is part of the protected clause in the constitution, right? Whereas whereas the system of law is very racial in 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 the United States, it's, it's, it's set along racial lines, and I think that one of the things that um, that um, might help people sort of understand that a the dynamics of power and oppression are, are are built out of the same vocabulary and the same concepts but two when um when we have uh, that the racial discourse uh, of Jews as white is flattening some of that complexity and at the same time the denial oh no no Jews are not white this kind of uh, reflexive denial um, also flattens some of the and 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 uh, some of that complexity because there is this legal aspect of uh, of uh, a, a, again becoming citizens and therefore having political rights, um, being able to vote, um, and 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 with that comes a lot of there is a, there's there's meaning to the word political capital. Um, and when when 
a whole population like Black Americans were um, targeted at disfranchisement, and we see today as well with the various gerrymandering uh, to exclude Black populations from voting or limit the power of their vote. Um, that political capital is smaller. And I, in the book, I talk about the sort of the reaction and what happened to the exclusion of Jews uh, of, of, um, uh, of uh, uh, one, one Jewish um, individual from hotel and uh, in both um, in Saratoga Springs and then later on the Lake Placid incident with uh, Melville Dewey of the Dewey Decimal System. Um, there is this political capital that Jewish citizens can use and organize and push uh, for change that black individuals didn't have because they didn't they were their their voting and their political power is restricted. So I think opening up and having these conversations is important on on uh, on laying this out. And showing some of the the habits of thinking about both groups that those dominant groups that that uh, both were in, in which both uh, both groups were, were op oppressed in some ways is also important to understand. Um, well, we are... Oh, the the halcyon of the of the nineteen forties, whether that was a moment. Yes. So one of the things is that again, this this comes in because the Nazis used um, American racial laws as a model for the Nuremberg laws against Jews, and this is in the nineteen thirties when we have when when Nazis are denaturalizing Jews when they are limiting the um a right of citizenship when they're introducing miscegenation laws and so on and so forth where um black americans are seizing the moment and saying look this is what we've been going here right it's the moment of of uh, of common cause and and an and and moment that that helps highlight the plight of of black Americans in, in the moment. And certainly Jewish intellectuals um, are, are part of that and they are seeing this. Uh, and then, um, you know, just as there is this, this discomfort with Jewish power for a different reason, there was this discomfort with black power once the uh, one black power emerged. And we see these sort of fissures and 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 breakdown. And again, um, and and some again, not all Jews were on on you know on board with civil rights and all that. Some Jews were, and some then left the bandwagon. Some stayed. Um, and I think thinking along the um, the lines of both the different views and not seeing Jews as a as a one group, whether white or always you know on the side of. Uh, one struggle or the other, um, and the the other thing. Oh, I had another thought that wanted to say, but it escaped me. And I might come back. Well, I mean, we are actually at time. Uh, okay, so, so it won't come back. <laughs> no, no, but but uh, you know, I'm on on, on, a, on I'll, I'll I'll offer one concluding thought of my own that um, one of the great lessons of, of Christian supremacy, which again is a fantastic book, I highly recommend everybody in the audience go out and buy a copy, um, is that politics, uh, especially group politics are complex, um, but they are sort of structured and mediated by, oh no, did, did this, <laughs> Did you want no, to... no, no, finish your thought. Finish oh, your... no, but they're structured and mediated by received law, received ideology. We sort of received uh, structures. Did you Did you remember? Or... Yes, my, my last thought was that, uh, you know, in terms of common moment and uh, and again, how our language might, uh, might, might be careful is this question, you know, sometimes Black anti-Semitism or Jewish racism. And we, I think we have to... Um, kind of move away from that and and ask ourselves whether there is anything particular about uh, anti-Jewish sentiments within the Black community that we could call it Black anti-Semitism, or whether there's just anti-Semitism so, uh, that or anti-Jewish animus that exists within a cer cer some some group some uh, members of the of the community. And similarly, Jewish racism is that such a thing as Jewish racism. 
or is it some individuals who may express racism or believe racist ideas and are racism so racism is it jewish or is it just racism uh so i think one of the ways to to maybe bridge is to give up these labels of path pathologizing uh prejudice by adding the the um adjectives before them and actually analyze and unpack them whether it is just simply um simply a form of prejudice bigotry on one group of the other and not pathologize it as, as if it was a single uh, singular of the other well i think that's a fantastic note to end on i want to thank you again professor tedder for uh, the talk i want to thank everybody in the audience uh, for coming out this afternoon i especially want to thank because i'm looking over the guest list um all of my students who have logged on today i i i said this morning in class you should Come to this talk and i'm glad at least some of you did um so thank you all uh so so much um and we will see everyone hopefully sometime soon at the at the next event thank you so much for having me thank you the students and everybody for coming thank you bye